Hello, my friends, and welcome to another epilogue of History That Doesn't Suck. I am your professor, Greg Jackson. And today, as I epilogue for the first time without Josh or CL, this is, this is a new chapter, I am joined by Ryan Griffith. Ryan, you want to say hello to the fine people? Hello, fine people. Excellent. So Ryan is a former student of mine from back in the day yep. at, at Utah Valley University. He is now an illustrious graduate student. Out, trying to be out in the DC area. <laughs> and uh, so he is stepping in to do a little bit of research. And I'm also joined by the one, the only Zach Weaver. Hi, Greg. How are you doing? Hey, there's actually probably more than one Zach Weaver in the, That's, in the I, world. That's huh? dollars to donuts. There's yeah. probably at least one more. <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, so, Zach, you are one of, uh, to kind of fill in people a little bit, I've, I've brought on a number of interns from Utah Valley University and from Brigham Young University. I forgive you, you, you come from the BYU side of that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but that's okay. Um, so there are a number of other uh, interns. Obviously, we, we can't put half a dozen on one epilogue, and uh, you've all been doing some great work. Um, Thank you oh, well, very much. You know, you're... I have to compliment you. Your mom's listening, so right? <laughs> yes, she is. Did, did you want to say hi to your mom? Hi, mom. How are you okay. doing? Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that's what this was really about. But uh, I, I do want to go ahead and just acknowledge all the other interns. You may have heard these names being listed among the additional research that's being done on on every episode. So, of course, we've got Zach, also Taylor Tree, Jack V, and Jack T. Uh, that's that's fine, right? <laughs> Jack Vasso, Jack Tingy, Mason Staffer. Will King and uh, Amy, uh, man, Amy, your last name, Hudek, I believe. <laughs> I've said that correctly. Amy can send me a strongly worded email later. Uh, also, someone who n I don't know if if Kelsey has ever been acknowledged on the podcast before. If you're following us on the social media accounts, you might be more aware of her. But Kelsey Dines, she has been handling social media and a number of other things in the background for quite a long time. So she was here when Josh and CL were here, at least uh, towards towards the end of Josh's days. So there are a number of people at this point involved in History That Doesn't Suck. And uh, we're just here with you, you two gentlemen this evening. But uh, we'll look forward to bringing on... Some so far better intern guests in the future. <laughs> I'm sorry, Zach. I would hope so. Yeah, no. yeah. Please do. <laughs> no, Zach, you you've done great work. Uh, you know that. I've told you that. I really have appreciated everything you're doing. So I I appreciate that you can get my sarcasm, and I hope your mom can. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, that's kind of the catch up on what's been going on with uh, HTDS, kind of behind the scenes. Per the usual, though, I always like to start with any notable little corrections. And gratefully, the pronunciation thing is dropping off, frankly, because as the podcast gets bigger, I'm grateful to have so many friends, uh, listeners uh, across the country. So these days, instead of praying I can find the correct pronunciation on some river in a state I have never visited somewhere and, and on the internets, which everything is trustworthy there. Uh, always. No, it's, it's not, I, you know, I can't even feign that one. I want to be very clear <laughs> when you're researching, you do not just grab the first website. That's not acceptable as my students have learned I think, when I grade their papers. I think Abraham Lincoln, it was Abraham Lincoln uh, who did. said, mm -hmm. everything you read on the internet is true. He so did. I saw that in a meme. Yeah. There go. So, yeah. yeah. A man ahead of his time. Truly. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> indeed. So I've got, as I see it, friends now just across the country. And it's so useful to be able to either get on uh, History That Doesn't Sucks Patreon account or the, the Facebook group. Those are kind of my go-tos. I've tried Twitter here and there. I mean, I'm I'm on there, but the Facebook group is where people are just super responsive for whatever reason. I can just double check pronunciations and I've got a local telling me how to say it. And just thank you to all of you. Uh, that all said, Murphy, my dear friend, 10-year-old Murphy out uh, in Tennessee, his mom sent me an email on his behalf. And uh, so episode 30, talk about a throwback. I mean, years ago, and Murphy, the up-and-coming historian of his generation, caught that 
I gave the wrong first name to a congressman, Congressman Floyd, I believe from Virginia. I'm going to throw a believe in there because, uh, well, I didn't note the state and now I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm riffing. And I, uh, it has been a while. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, naturally, I mean, I have to go look up the script. Like, we're, we're talking about something years ago. How how many times has, that, has this been listened to? Sure enough, Murphy, you are just brilliant, sir. And, uh, you know, if you feel like coming out to Utah when you get to college age, love to have you in a class. So, Murphy, my thanks to you. And that has been addressed in that episode. So, that's all we've got on on that front this time around. We've acknowledged the changes in the in the crew. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Zach, Ryan, let's have a little bit of a chit chat here. Let's do it. You've uh, I'm ready to roll. Excellent. So you've joined me on this volume that is the Wild West. We've built and rode the Transcontinental Railroad. We hung out with some gunslingers, and and then we we saw the thing come to a close. For me, the the big most important piece of all this is really the second industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we we saw that very clearly right out the gate with the Transcontinental Railroad itself. I loved setting up and, and trying to show, and I, I hope that it became very clear in, in episode 83, what a significant world-altering technology the steam-powered locomotive really is. It was huge. It, it was crazy to... Yeah, to think about and to digest that as we research, it's incredible. And I think that we included this in the episode, but that the Transcontinental Railroad really was the landing on the moon of the 1800s that was an all-hands-on-deck kind of effort in the United States to to change the West and ultimately change the, the shape of the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, the impact of it, I might argue, at least to date, more significant than the moon landing, which was awesome and cool the railroad changed everyone's day-to-day life which i i don't know that we'll i, I would go so far as to say that the moon landing has necessarily fair. done that i mean I, obviously yeah. we can make larger arguments about uh being in space and what have satellites done I, I i get that but the transcontinental railroad the impact it had immediately you don't have to go out a click or two and then talk about larger extrapolations of how that technology would then you know, lead to other things. The day that thing opened, you could now traverse the continent in a matter of days, right? This this massive effort that took months previously, that was a harrowing risk to life as uh, to go back to the Oregon Trail episodes. And now it's a ticket on a train. Life-changing, nation-changing. Yeah. And I think that You start to see the American character being forged on those rails, that America becomes what it is today, in large part because of the second industrial revolution, because of these changes that are happening on the transcontinental railroad. We were kind of riffing on this a little bit earlier, Zach, right? We were talking about how there's always been an an independence of the American spirit, if you will, right? Good word. Thank you. (laughs) See what I did there? (laughs) Yeah, you made sure to declare that independence. Yeah. Oh, dear. Wow. <laughs> I, I feel like Josh would be proud. I'm not invited you know, on the podcast anymore. Yes, uh, in uh, fact, Zach, if you can actually leave right now, I think, <laughs> I think Ryan and I have this. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, but it, it really, it's, it becomes heightened. And, and I think homesteading leads to, I mean, so many of the, of the life of the pioneer that feels very isolated. And then the way that it is, remembered and romanticized by Buffalo Bill, that all adds to whatever independence there may already have legitimately been in that space. Buffalo Bill takes that and he just knocks the walls down. He makes it feel far more independent than than was reality. Because really, uh, all of these pioneers, uh, at least once we, we get into the latter part of the 19th century, I mean, I mentioned the Sears catalogs, right? Montgomery Ward. There's a robust national economy that people across the nation, they're tapping into. You can't rob trains unless ridiculous sums of wealth are being transferred across those trains. You don't have the gunslingers, the outlaws, and all all those aspects that we identify with the golden years of the cowboy of the Wild West, the Old West however you want to describe the American West of the mid to late 19th century, 
it, it can't exist. It can't be there without the railroad. To me, and this was one of my favorite parts of this whole several episodes that we covered, it, it was cool to see how everyday Americans of, I mean, every different race, creed, right? Every group, to some extent, ends up kind of catching that vision that the railroad brings, right? And, you know, you're talk about like the beef industry, that which we discussed, right? Blows up and, you know, brings incredible wealth to some people, incredible opportunity. And it was fun to see that on both sides of the law, right? That in one way or another, people were inspired by the new world that was created by the railroad. And they took advantage of that. Yeah. And on an international level as well. Yeah. Right? I mean... We're now talking about trade going from the East Coast clear across the Pacific and off to Asia, as as our friend Asa Whitney dreamed of. Mm -hmm. So it's funny to think, and we covered this in the episode, but that he was laughed at by people across the country for this whole idea of, no, we're going to connect with rail and it'll bring prosperity and opportunity like we haven't even thought of. And he was oh, like he, laughed he was spot at on all the time. Yeah, but it was you know, genius. Well, that's the thing with dreamers, right? Is that they're always laughed at and many times they are wrong. It's always laughable until they're right. And he was. Now, of course, as we say that, that would not be the feeling, sentiment and experience of say the Cheyenne or the Sioux. This is true. Right? And, and this is a constant. This is something that... <laughs> 21st century Americans can certainly re relate to. Yeah, 21st century, anyone can relate to. Whenever there's disruption, right? There are changes. There are winners and there are losers. And the railroad, of course, brought that as well. So as we have certainly lived through an era with the rise and fall of dot-coms and now increasingly ordering things online, and, and there are winners and losers in all that, right? And I, I think we can sometimes feel as though these rapid changes, these massive disruptions that they're new. Well, obviously those specific changes are new, but as though we're the only ones who've gone through that. When, if you think about, I mean, imagine being an older attendee at the Chicago's, uh, the Chicago's there. Uh, well, the nice, Columbia nice, nice spoken in typo. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the World Columbian Expo Exposition hosted in Chicago in 1893. If you're an older American, if you live before the railroad became a thing, you have watched the world go from a place where travel over land was at best Pony Express, zipping at an incredible 15 miles per hour and having to change horses. And you'd have to be this twig <laughs> athlete to pull it, you know, to even participate in this mm -hmm. thing, right? And no individual could do it. Only male, think about that, male can travel at this speed because it's too exhausting for a single person. This did not make it into the episode, but Buffalo Bill, who may or may not have ridden for the Pony Express, right? Yes. He, <laughs> may uh, or may not is going to be a frequent phrase with, with good old Bu Buffalo, Buffalo Bill. Bill which, <laughs> and w w I, I want to tease on, uh, this out a bit more. I, I love this. As a historical figure, he's so fascinating because here's this man who's so obsessed with authenticity and, and reality and realism. And Yet his life is so potentially not true, right? It, so I I really enjoy complicated figures, and he's the epitome of it. But we'll table that for just a second. Eyes on the prize, him Pony Express. What didn't make it in there is that allegedly, if we even believe he rode for the Pony Express, and this all gets into someone who doesn't mind making a legend of himself. It is said that this man who is one of the youngest ever to have ridden for the Pony Express also happens to have made the longest, if not one of the longest rides in the history of the Pony Express, that he got to his next station after his grueling several hours in the saddle. And if, if you haven't ridden a horse, which I realize is not necessarily the most common experience, uh, maybe those of us in the West have a a little more opportunity to, to do that. I have not. You have not, Zach. Really? No, I think I'd break the horse's back. I'm a larger fellow. So. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, I, uh, I I do not think you would pull a, a fuss and feathers. So <laughs> if, if you remember the, the, the general who had to be lowered onto his horse. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, I think you'll do just fine. <laughs> um, 
we can remedy that. Maybe a history that doesn't suck. A uh, horseback outing. Yes. A yes. retreat for yes. all the a, interns. A retreat. Yeah. That's that's in the budget. So, <laughs> <laughs> so join the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> so we're because that's gonna be the enticer. They're all mm-hmm. like, you know what? Zach needs to ride horses. Exactly. That's it. Let me let me pull out the card. Uh, so there's no one at the next station for whatever reason, and so of course, despite having just completed this ride uh, to the point, if you haven't ridden a horse, it is exhausting. It is not uh, an easy, and I don't say that as some sort of skilled horseman by any means i can stay up on a horse I, I, I've, I've ridden at high enough of a speed to know that if i rode at an actually fast speed i would be exhausted i, I mean you're balancing you are you're getting it's a bumpy ride it was the original full body workout right totally <laughs> absolutely yeah all the fancy equipment people are buying just go get a horse and ride for an hour or two a day i'll i'll take care of you probably <laughs> you know what i mean I'm, I'm a historian don't take my advice on workouts okay there's, there's, there's someone better for that but uh so he supposedly rides two legs in a row so naturally wh- whether or not he even rode for the the pony express right th- that's a big question mark but if you believe he did well he also just happens to have been the most heroic rider in the history of the pony express which to just continue to connect dots uh again here's something that's in and out you know, a technology, right? That if we can frame it that way, to think of the infrastructure, to put the infrastructure in place for these horses to connect from station to station to station and move them, move mail that rapidly. And we covered it and it's in and out within 18 months, right? Mm-hmm. So because of how rapidly technology is changing, I mean, it's basically like, it's it's the car phone of its era, you know? Like <laughs> it's, yes. it is hot and sexy <laughs> for like five minutes and then it's gone. It's it's done. That's really well put. Thank you. That's a, I mean, it's like gone. I we have discussed these things before, but that like that, that was on it. the cake, boom. Oh, and it's a if if only if only that episode weren't recorded. Yeah, that yeah. that'd have been pro- it's okay. That's what the blog's for. And I think yes. that the Pony Express is another good example of not just how quickly this technology is changing, but also how we remember the West and how we remember the frontier. Because the Pony Express, like Greg said, is only here for 18 months, but we can't have a Wild West movie without Pony Express riders. And because of Buffalo Bill and some of the showmen of his day, those technologies that we think of with the Old West that may not have been around for a super long time are enshrined in the American memory of what the West was and how we think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, for me, a lot of it boils down to time, right? I feel like time and how we thought about time and measured time just changed so dramatically for people all across the country, right? It was well, and, and literally can, yeah. with the train com- you know, companies all going, you know what, guys, this sucks. Uh, we need to sync up. Exactly. Yeah. So then, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't. Happened. I totally took your your steam you right out of your it's, locomotive. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> your fireman was just shoveling away, and yeah, I was it's, like, "It's over now." Now I doused it like Sam Bass's <laughs> men at a. Wow, these are some super Big lame sports. insider jokes at this point. Like if if, you, if they've listened, <laughs> oh, they've they listened. Know. Oh yeah, we're we're it crushing incentivizes it. people to yeah. go back and listen. There to it these is. Episodes. Yep. Yeah, because you know what someone's thinking right now. Shucks, I didn't quite get Greg's lame dad joke. <laughs> Man, I need to go back and <laughs> and, and revisit that episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Ryan. You were seeing something smart and no, time. you're fine. You're fine. But time, really, and because yes, 18 that, months is not a long time frame at all, and yet it's like today. I'm sure within a reasonable distance of where we're recording tonight, we can go and see sites that you know these original Pony Express riders went to, where they oh. would water the horses and switch out riders and pick up more mail or drop stuff off. And there, so, there's a campsite right near one. Went camping with uh, my my kids' uh, scout troop just a few months ago. Nice. It is the middle of effing nowhere. <laughs> like, I mean, and hey, I, I had a great time. My big regret is that I didn't bring my telescope because there was zero light pollution. It was gorgeous. But yeah, it was the middle of nowhere. It, it was the sort of campsite where halfway there I started thinking, I'm driving the wrong vehicle. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I remember visiting one of these sites as a kid and I mean, it was kind of cool. Like, you know, I'd seen wild West movies, right? Pony express riders. Like I got it, but very quickly it was the, 
yeah, this really is the middle of nowhere. I have no idea how these people got around for the sake of delivering their mail and knew exactly what direction to head off in. And it's pretty crazy. Well, and this is where I think it's, it's really fascinating. Just think about the romanticization. Think about actually being a part of this. Imagine being the bored to tears sucker that lives at one of these way stations waiting for a rider. <laughs> Horrible. It is your job to have no neighbors at all. I mean, it, it's basically, okay, so it's basically like the last year for most of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's, but but, but not with it's, no Netflix. <laughs> I was about to say, it's quarantine without the internet. It's Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to go all Thoreau here, you know, I, I guess this, this, this is, is their Walden Pond. It, precisely. <laughs> this is the job for you. Yeah. People aren't bringing you pies, though, you know? Yeah, no, there's... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, if anything, the, those Pony Express riders are like, what do you have for me? I'm exhausted. I just rode. Mm -hmm. You've been sitting here all day. Yeah. In sweatpants, waiting for me to drop off some mail. That is that is it. That is not anachronistic at all. No. Sweatpants, were, <laughs> sweatpants were huge in the 19th century. <laughs> So my pants were not huge in the 19th century. That was a disclaimer. Levi okay. Strauss was. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, sir. Indeed. Well, it's catching on, catching on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's circle over to, to Buffalo Bill some more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so Ryan. Yeah. We've discussed and let's let's do this in, in greater detail because we, we kind of kept it brief. I, I, I don't want to throw away the enthusiasm and realism of, of the real conversation. So you were saying though earlier a little bit about Cody, Wyoming, your illustrious experience. So the, the most recent episode, the end of the wild west, we got to meet Buffalo Bill. We followed him up to 1893. Then of course we sauntered on over to the expo, left, left Buffalo Bill collecting fat stacks of cash just outside of it and good for him. But we didn't follow him through to the end of his life. So we didn't ever get to him founding freaking cody wyoming right and a footnotes version he also does a show in the uk at uh, queen victoria's jubilee d does a show in uh italy heads over to the vatican and uh, otherwise tours europe tries to divorce his wife i, I believe uh, if i recall correctly the judge says no but they <laughs> wanted to terminate the marriage different era yeah um and then uh, and we can circle back to this later uh, to just kind of round it out starts to step into the film world because films are becoming a thing in the early 20th century and so shows like his are starting to decline that doesn't work out so great for him and he ends up dying not as wealthy as he once was in 1917 it's true okay so his life sketch done ryan Cody, Wyoming. You, we were talking about memory and the way things play out there. Yeah. So I had the pleasure, and I, I mean, that wasn't sarcasm. Like it, it was actually a fun town to live in. But yeah, sure. You're I, not dialing. Uh, the, I don't think the people of Cody, Wyoming, got the impression you're dialing that back at all. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> yeah. No, I actually really did enjoy living in Cody, no. Wyoming, for about six, eight months a few years back, and uh, I went in in like spring. Uh, into the late summer. So I was able to see the Cody Stampede Rodeo in all its glory. It's like one of the rodeos across the nation. There is literally a rodeo every night for like three months straight. You are, okay. Man, I mean, we, we do rodeos here in Utah. Yes. I mean, that's, that's a big thing. We have a good lot rodeos of, here. We do. But. So the town I live in, there's a rodeo grounds and there's a rodeo once a year for a few days so when you tell me that it's on the daily for months yeah I, i'm just thinking about the sustained effort i mean it is a big deal to put on a rodeo that's no small thing yeah it's it's fantastic and i'm in mean, like the best of the best as they're up and coming in the rodeo world they all go through cody because like and like the whole town there's you know it's a really a beautiful area um but yeah everybody comes out they have a, a fantastic uh, arena and, you know, huge bleachers. It's on the west end of town, if I remember correctly. And yeah, the rodeo is huge. Everybody goes. So I loved getting to see that. And uh, of course, went to the huge, you know, Buffalo Bill Museum there. But uh, yeah, sticking with Buffalo Bill, um, talking with a few people in town, there, there are definitely mixed responses, you know. Some people are, you know, sing his praises and they're 
other people I definitely remember hearing, you know, talking, oh, he was a philanderer and a womanizer and he wasn't as great as some people think. But man, uh, still such an interesting life. The Irma Hotel, still there. During the summers, they'll do uh, fake like, a, you know, gunslinger fights outside. And fun fact, the original bar, which if I'm not mistaken, is made out of cherry, um, but it's huge. It's still inside the Irma, which is named after his daughter. And so we got to go in there. They have fantastic food, you know, just like the whole atmosphere. I mean, you're thrown right back into the original founding, you know, the high days of Cody, Wyoming. Well, see, Cody, Wyoming is going to send you uh, a thankful email now. I, I feel like you you basically just did a tourism bureau, like, Oh, there's, there's, there, there, there's it's... more. I don't know if everyone <laughs> wants to hear it, but it, it really is. Like, it's a fun town, and it was so cool to see the history of it. So I, I had a lot of fun you know, bringing back the old memories with writing these episodes. It's a good time. Okay. Well, so uh, let me just get a reaction, if I may, from you to uh, esteemed Please. gents here. Buffalo Bill, what what do you make of his obsession with with realism, right? Of, with authenticity. And I find fascinating that so many people sign off on the authenticity of his shows. Right, lots of big names, bland people, if I may, as well. You know, people <laughs> people that you wouldn't look at and go, yeah, you're you're prone to exaggeration. That to me uh, is, I'm I'm not saying that that lends authenticity to what he did. I find it fascinating that so many would sign off, though. Yeah. I think that one of the interesting figures that we didn't have an opportunity to go over in these episodes is P.T. Barnum. Yes. And he's someone who's often known as a huckster and and kind of a... There's a documentary about him recently. I a believe. shadier fellow, a historically accurate documentary, yes, yes. Uh, a musical one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> And Hugh Buffalo Jackman Bill. really just nailed the is, is my, I'm sorry, <laughs> apparently my sarcasm is not really thick with, with you two. Um, <laughs> let me be very clear that that was not a documentary. I'm sorry, Zach, I'm going to shut up and let you finish your thought now. No, please, absolutely. But one of the interesting things is that one of the quotes that we found that landed on the cutting room floor in the episode yeah. is Buffalo yeah. Bill comparing himself to P.T. Barnum. And he says that this is not about Barnum and this isn't about making money, that this is about showing America, what the West is like and showing Europe what the West is like. And so I think that that's what Bill wants to do. The money, I'm sure he definitely appreciated because he made quite quite a stack. But it is important to know that his big goal was to bring authenticity, was to bring the West to the East, was to show America what was happening on the frontier. Uh, It's important to note that Bill didn't seek stardom. He didn't start out seeking stardom. He was found by Ned Buntline, who wrote a dime novel about him while he was in a bar in uh, Nebraska. So it's important to know that Bill isn't originally getting into this as kind of a, a way to cash in on this image and make money. He really wants to almost like a a museum to show Native Americans as they truly were and to show Rough Riders as they truly were in the West, or at least in the West as he experienced it. It definitely isn't the same experience for African Americans or Chinese Americans building the railroad or Native Americans, but the West as Bill experienced it, he's trying to bring that as authentically to these audiences as he can. And I think that that's a testament to him. And I think that's one of the reasons why he's pulling crowds of 17, 18, 19,000 people every single show, because people crave authenticity. You nailed on the head here, Zach. So many, uh, so many things just, I agree. An authenticity of how he experienced, of how he saw it, and and how so many, frankly, white settlers would have seen and experienced and, and viewed it. Um, the one curious thing I find about him, I, I think about, he's got this line he doesn't want to cross. That that was clear for me, where things have to be authentic, but he's also got, how do I put this? The world of, of reality and showmanship blurred in his head. So yes, he's obsessed with authenticity. And yet at the same time, he's simultaneously showman while still doing things in the West, right? He's doing shows and going out as a scout. And this might precede his launching Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he's doing Wild West shows, you know, we uh, mentioned in the episode that he kills uh, yellow hair slash yellow hand, depending on the 
you know, translation, translation, right. And that he wore a actual stage costume, right. Out on an army, you know, again, it was a very unexpected moment. He didn't know that he was going to end up being in a fight, um, you know, but everything about it, even down to his ultimately when both men draw, both men fire and Buffalo Bill then chooses to scalp him. And is he, at least according to his story, right, exclaims his, uh, this is the the first scalp for, for Custer. It, all of this feels to me like somebody who, when he's in the West, is thinking about things he can do that he can then take to the stage. And so it's undercutting, you know, it's undercutting the authenticity of it without him realizing it's undercutting the authenticity because things he does as a scout, as whatever in the West, he's often doing so, at least in his latter years in, in these experiences, thinking about being able to tell that story on stage. So mm-hmm. it's leading him to make different choices and do different things that are perhaps more exciting right? than, uh, than otherwise would be that, that thought. Yeah, no, I, I, I've had, I had similar thoughts, similar reaction, okay. because I think if half of the stories and claims about Buffalo Bill are true, the man lived a pretty remarkable life, right? Pretty unique. Yes. He, oh, and, and you know, and I won't doubt that. I think he did lead a remarkable yeah. life because I mean, to your very point, I'm sure half of them are true. Yeah. Or at least they're all halfway true. <laughs> yeah. Either of those <laughs> adds up to a remarkable life. Yes. So I think the Buffalo Bill that I came to kind of know a little bit more throughout this, and I mean, I'm sure it can be argued otherwise, but is... There, are, there aren't like massive books written on... No, yeah, not at no, all. Yeah. People super agree you know, on Me is <laughs> my humble self. I am an expert. Right? No. Um, but uh, it seemed to me that, yeah, he lives this unique life and he loves to tell and show a good story, you know, to show these experiences and what these unique experiences were like to other people. And it's just this big thrill and sense of adventure that I think in many ways causes him to continue to go out and seek more adventure and, and, you know, cool opportunities. And yeah, he, he, he loved the wild West life, right? Yes. Absolutely absolutely. loved it and loved to share it with people because for him, it was this grand adventure that was extremely rewarding in many ways. Yeah. And that was honestly, and I think Ryan, you'd agree, that was probably the most fun part about researching these episodes was all of the different characters that we got to meet. Absolutely. Because Buffalo Bill is, he's the man. If half of those stories are true, then he is one of, he's the world's most interesting man. Yes. Um, <laughs> he is, yes, of the 19th century. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but not just him, but Thomas Durant. And the big four and Sam Bass and Brigham Young and Sitting Bull and Annie oh, Oakley, all of them. Right. These are just larger than life figures. And, so much and fun. It's, I would say, you know, it's not that these people aren't born today. It's this world that they're inhabiting where the second industrial revolution, the uh, massive and rapid settlement the lack of infrastructure, yet sufficient infrastructure for money to be flying around, mm-hmm. but not sufficient infrastructure to protect that wealth or secure in a very stabilizing way what, what society is. Uh, to be able to pick up from one town and just head, uh, I mean, th- think about the Earps brothers for, for just a second, right? Yeah. Freaking uh, accused, uh, you know, can't say if, if why it was guilty or not, but accused of stealing a horse one day and a lawman the next you don't play those games you know in modern america yeah. you, you, no, you know no, i mean no, no. it's the equivalent of being charged with basically grand theft auto I, you, you couldn't go get charged with grand theft auto in one state Be like eh, i'll just i'll just go join the police force in another state <laughs> that's cool right or e- even um uh, billy the kid who may not have played on both sides of the line as it were in in, in the legal world but you know uh well Looks like I just uh, may have committed manslaughter. Well, let's just go one uh, one territory over. That should that should solve <laughs> the problem, right? Yep. And it super does for a while. And you have uh, you have interesting stories that we've talked about where you have someone like Thomas Durant who is a businessman and is an entrepreneur, and he's using some 
shady and unethical practices in his business. And on the other hand, you have someone like Sam Bass, who when he does the Big Springs robbery, he won't rob women and I believe it's elderly people as well, right? Uh, Specifically, I think Big Springs is where there was a gentleman who was missing a hand. Hmm. And yeah, they they would not. Yeah, this curious... Well, these moral I, codes yes, for these people are right because you you think right you assume someone who's going to spurn the law would spurn other ethical codes or moral right. codes that and, we and, have. And, and yet they do abide to some degree and, and it, even that is hit and miss mm-hmm. but then mm-hmm. that can all get romanticized and they become you know I, honestly my favorite romanticized figure in all of this i didn't see this happening but it's pearl hart Mm, from incredible the incredible story well yeah i mean the I, I i don't say this to take away from her at all but like how crazy is it that uh th- this woman who's just trying to get back to her her mom right like what an uh, a crap situation she's in her mother's dying she's so desperate at this point she's ready to uh, hold up a stagecoach she fails to rob a stagecoach that is her entire career as an outlaw a failed stagecoach robbery Exactly one, right? Uno, that's it. One and done. She's a freaking dime novel hero through the next century. I, I just feel like if there's anyone who kind of embodies like the way that the Wild West becomes far larger than reality, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, it's it's Pearl Hart. Who, it's not like she asked for it, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, I'm sure she wasn't thinking. Years from now, these three dudes <laughs> yes. will be talking about me. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. 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 Yeah. But it's important that that story is included because we think of the Wild West as solely a masculine field that these are these big strong men out there slinging guns and doing yeah. these things. And we have Annie Oakley, who's a better shot than all of them. Um, oh, absolutely. We have her and Pearl okay. Hart and some of these wonderful uh, female characters that we met along the I way. I know I made mm-hmm. this comment in passing in that episode, but... I frankly find it just astounding that Buffalo Bill, who was an excellent shot, not taken away from the guy, really. It, it, in, incredible. I mean, he got his his name, Buffalo Bill, because of the astounding number of Buffalo the man killed. He yeah. He's a good shot. But do you really call yourself the all-round world champion? <laughs> when you're shooting after Annie Oakley, I mean... Little I, sure shot. Yeah. I read the accounts of her show. I read the accounts of his show. Not bad. Like, okay, he, he's good. Yeah. She is God's gift to the uh, to the sport of shooting. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, to your point, Zach, the Wild West is simply a far more diverse place than I think many of us often imagine in the 21st century. So I've got to cut my conversation that I was having and continued to have with Zach and Ryan at that point. We simply kept going, and there were so many interesting things to explore from Buffalo Bill's friendship with Sitting Bull to Frederick Douglass's speech at the Columbian Exposition, but we just don't have time to uh, to continue to discuss. So I'm going to cut that off there just to completely level with, uh, with everyone listening. This is the first epilogue without Josh or Ciel, and I didn't know how this would go. I didn't know exactly how I would move forward. You know, this this is just a new experience. So in preparation for the end of this volume, I went ahead and took a crack at the interview game. So I went up to Promontory Summit, being in Utah, that's not too far away, as many of you already know. And I sat down with the lead park ranger up there, Lucas Hugi, and we kind of did a, a deep dive discussion on the history of the actual place where the Golden Spike ceremony happened. So we're going to go to that now. Let me just say thank you to everyone for continuing on this journey through U.S. history with me. I appreciate it more than words can say. And we will continue with the 19th century. I am going to actually remaster just episode one. I'm very curious what that sounds like with Airship's Touch. So kind of in a little bit of an experiment. That will be the following episode after this epilogue. But from there, we will just continue on with our march through U.S. history. So that's what you can look forward to. And all that said, please join me after this short break uh, as I sit down with park ranger Lucas Hugie.
And welcome back. So I am now at Promontory Summit, and I am joined by Lucas Hugie, the lead park ranger here. This is a National Park Service location. And uh, Lucas, may I call you Lucas? Do you oh, prefer please. Park Ranger Hugie? Oh, please, just Lucas. <laughs> okay, well, Lucas, thank you uh, again for allowing me to drop in and chat with you. I'm really excited about this. Yeah, me too. It's a... Uh... So we were a National Historic Site. Uh, we got changed to a historical park in March of 2019. Uh, the oh. big difference between the two is a historic site only has one resource at it. In our case, we have a hole in the ground where a golden spike was once placed. And a historical park has to have multiple resources. So we actually identified other features of historical significance inside the park. And that's how we got changed from historic site to historical park. Okay, so it's it's an upgrade. It is. It's a little upgrade in the name. Very nice. And of course, I'm assuming with the timing there, that has a little something to maybe do with the 150th anniversary. It has everything to do with the 150th. Okay. Uh, so in anticipation of the 150th anniversary, the completion of the first transcontinental railroad, they decided to give us a name change, which was very welcome since we have so many resources here at the park. Sure. Well, and we will get into all that. I feel like I'm already starting to jump the gun. I know this is going to be a, a this is going to be a fun conversation. You said, and maybe this is kind of sticking on what we were just talking about here for a brief few seconds, that the history of this spot, of this very location that we are at, is quite unique and interesting. Care to go ahead and unload on that a bit? Oh, exactly. So this was a agreed upon location to complete the railroad. Both companies estimated that their track building crews would be here in the Promontory Summit area in May of 1869. So that's how they settled on this location. However, it's really not convenient for anyone. So May 10th, 1869, we complete the Transcontinental Railroad here. We drive the last spike. And for a brief moment in time, this is a railroad hub. So if you were traveling out with the Union Pacific, you would travel all the way to here, and then the Union Pacific doesn't go any farther west. This is the end of the line for them. So you would then get a ticket with the Central Pacific, get on their train, and keep heading west to California if that's your destination. There's just one problem with that model, and that is that we lack a lot of resources out here that people and locomotives need to just operate. So one newspaper forecasted that this location, that Promontory Summit, was actually going to become the future Chicago of the West. And there were land speculators predicting that we were going to have lines branch out from Promontory Summit and go all around the American West. But as I mentioned, we are lacking a resource, and that resource is water. Right. <laughs> so we can't have a dry town out here. So in uh, uh, eventually, the Central Pacific realized that making their passengers essentially use Promontory Summit as a layover, because this is where you get your connecting flight, or this is where you switch companies. Right. Making them wait out here in the sagebrush with rattlesnakes and no shade and no water isn't a great business model. So in November of 1869, the Central Pacific bought the rights to the rail, rather, from here down to Ogden. And in November of 1869, Ogden became the changeover point, because Ogden has great amenities like water and they also have buildings <laughs> not made out of canvas, which is a huge, huge advantage. And uh, Well, the, I, I can't imagine why you'd want more than canvas. No. I mean, come on. <laughs> we have a description that a journalist wrote of the town of Promontory. And you mentioned that we're 4,900 feet above sea level here at this location. But he mentioned that uh, religiously, we're probably 49,000 feet below the surface of the earth. So that gives you an idea of what kind of town was out here. A Hell on Wheels, if we may. Uh, this was probably one of the last Hell on Wheels town. Yes. Okay. There was discussion between CP and UP leadership before the, the Golden Spike ceremony and, and so forth that Ogden would become a terminus, a, a, a hub. Yeah, I, I know you're spot on about Promontory and all the, the land speculation and all that. Do you have any idea why there was the, the speculation and the thought that Promontory would turn into this Chicago when there was already discussion of Ogden you know, long before May uh, of that year? The Union Pacific continually changed where they thought they were going to build to. They thought that they were going to build all the way to the Nevada-California border at one point, and that the Central Pacific would never leave the boundaries of California. But as the Central Pacific got out of the mountains and start building faster, they had to adjust that target. And the Central Pacific also wanted as much track as they could get their hands on. 
So while both companies may have looked at Ogden initially as a good meeting point, this is the area where they just agreed to finish the railroad and then maybe have an idea later on of where to move that railroad hub. And when this area turned out not to be uh, the Chicago of the West, <laughs> they quickly had to adjust that plan to have just a more profitable business venture. Well, I just want you to know, I find the the parking lot here absolutely uh, <laughs> Uh, incredible. So uh, m- maybe maybe something will, will yet grow out here. Well, we actually share a lot with Chicago. They have a national park site, and we have a national park site. So we have we actually have a lot of similarities. Yeah, right there. I, it, it, it seems like this is it's it's just waiting to happen. Still, yeah. clearly, clearly. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, the hub goes to Ogden. Uh, the tent saloons eventually dry up, and and all the the attempts to make a town here. Where do we go from there? How how does Promontory... Move? Actually, Promontory stays as a town. So locomotives, like they were operating in the 1860s and 70s, they have a max range of around 15 to 30 miles. That's, what, uh, that's the limitations of steam power. So the locomotives hold about, well, use, thinking of ours, they hold about 2,800 gallons of water. There's 800 gallons in the boiler and 2,000 gallons in the tender behind the engine. And that only gets you 15 to 30 miles. So every couple of 15 to 30 miles on the track, you're going to have to have a little town to support the locomotives. If you've ever heard of the term jerkwater town or backwater town, that's actually where the term comes from. Because the first thing an engineer is going to do when he pulls into a town is reach outside the locomotive, jerk on a chain, and out comes a water spout from the water tower to top off the tender on the locomotive. So the town of Promontory became a watering hole for locomotives uh, heading east and west, uh, both directions on the track. And so to have a town like that, you need to have 20 or 30 people out here to maintain the water tower and maintain the fuel for the locomotives, which is why the town of Promontory continued as a watering station. We actually had enough uh, people here to necessitate a school. So we had, uh, in the end, we had three schools out here. Uh, The first two actually burned down. But one of the last buildings here on the site was actually the old schoolhouse, which got moved off the site when the Park Service took over the property in about 1965. Okay. Well, Promontory survived a little bit more than I realized. All right. That's interesting. Now, here's a completely nerdy question for you. I'm kind of curious about the supply chain of water. We just established that this place is arid. (laughs) There's no water. So here we are servicing trains with water. Is it just being brought in by other trains? And Initially, it was. For about the first year, it was actually brought in by train. So there's some great photographs in the uh, Hart collection. He was a photographer for the Central Pacific. And he shows a locomotive with just a bunch of, it looks like big barrels on the back of it. And it's bringing water to these more remote locations that need water to sustain the locomotives. Eventually, about a year later, they figured out where a spring was that's about a mile north of us. And they piped in water from the spring, and that's where we get our water. Back in 1869, they tried sinking a well out here. They went down 40 feet, 50 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet, which was the limits of the technology at the time, and they couldn't find water. Our well today goes down about 400 feet, so you really have to dig deep to get water here. Well, but now that you've got the well, clearly it's it's time to be on par with Chicago. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So basically, you took us into the 20th century here, right? The park services taking over, the school getting moved. So what happens with with the site from there? How how does it start to really come onto the map? So where we start to taper off as a railroading town is about 1904. And in 1904, they built the Lucin Cutoff, which was initially a trestle. Later, it was a causeway that goes right across the Great Salt Lake. As soon as they built that, the town of Promontory started to become a ghost town because the main line for the railroad no longer comes through northern Utah. Finally, 1939, the tracks are officially abandoned, and then in 1942, a call goes out across the country for all unused rail to get pulled up for the war effort, and uh, all 90 miles or so of track in northern Utah, the original Promontory line, as it became known, actually got pulled up. So we didn't have any track out here in 1965. Wow. So all the track that we see out there, I mean, we are, what, we're we're yards away, as as we're having this conversation, yards away from where the final ceremony actually happened. Yes. All all that rail, though, none of that then is what was laid by 
those Chinese and Irish workers, the CP, the UP, this, this is all replacement. Nope. The only thing uh, behind the visitor center that's original is the actual earth that they made into railroad grade. All of the rails, all the tools, everything else is a replica. However, the interesting thing about our rails is they're all antique rails from the 1880s. Oh. That's about the right size, and they're made out of steel. The original 1869 rails would have been iron, and they wouldn't have lasted that long. So we have long-lasting Period correct rails out there at the moment. Okay, so as close as, you know, could be, and clearly, given the material difference, they were going to bite the, the dust eventually anyway. Okay, okay, interesting. So the site itself, as it turns into a ghost town, is basically forgotten by America, right? Yes. By 1942, all the residents of Promontory and all the other little towns up here in northern Utah that service locomotives they went away because the tracks went away, and there's really no reason to live out here unless the trains are coming through. Then finally, in 1916, the Southern Pacific Railroad, heirs to the Central Pacific, they erect a little monument out here, which is in the front of our visitor center. It's a little obelisk. And uh, I say little, it's uh, about three tons. Uh, <laughs> but they <laughs> no, let, It's all relative, yes. Lucas. It's all relative. But they put that out here, and that's the only thing designating this spot as the completion point for the Transcontinental Railroad for a very long time. That just seems crazy to me. I mean, it's such a big, and I realize I'm saying this on the heels of the 150th anniversary. You know, I mean, just, just so you know, I've, I've got my 150th anniversary socks on. You know, I felt that that was needed for today. So the idea that it's just not cared about this is a little mind-blowing for someone who lives in Utah. It, it essentially gets forgotten for a very long time. Finally, in the late 1940s, there's an interest in the history of the area and in the history of the railroad. It starts in 1947. They actually decide to do a, an anniversary of the settlers coming to Utah, and it's the 100-year anniversary. So they do a lot of different events, uh, and when I say they, it's the Daughters of Utah Pioneers. Okay. They decide to host a lot of history events to uh, develop an appreciation for the history of Utah, and this is one of the things that they hone in on. So they actually research what the ceremony would have looked like, kind of a best guess of, of what happened in 1869. They put it together. And they actually have it down in Salt Lake City in 1947. I believe it was at the Hotel Utah. And, of course, it's Daughters Utah Pioneers. So they actually get their husbands, they draft their husbands into the mix and have them perform the reenactment ceremony. And then in the early 50s, someone gets the idea of, what if we did that reenactment out here at the last spike site? There's nothing out there anymore, but what if we did it on location? And that starts as tradition. And, and Lucas, I'll just say that as you make me more fully aware of just what a completely forgotten location this had become, you know, you'd mentioned before we started recording just a little bit as we were touching base and some things we were going to discuss. I, I was kind of wondering when you said, oh, down Salt Lake, and I thought... Well, why would you do the reenactment town? That now that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, who's going to come out to them? This is nothing but sagebrush, apart from, <laughs> apart from the, the the building that we're in and and the now restored rail, which of course isn't going to be there. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it right after World War II. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay, that that makes a whole lot of sense. I think we need to talk more about how this reenactment works. Let's okay. just take a quick break, and then we'll pick right up with that. And welcome back. I am still here with Lucas, our uh, illustrious lead park ranger here at Promontory Summit. And uh, Lucas, we we're going to get into the reenactment itself, the, the script and all that jazz, right? Yes. Okay. Enlighten me, sir. So the history of the reenactment and the park are very intertwined. They really go together. It started with a reenactment and then we added on the location. And then eventually in the early 60s, there is some interest in creating a national park site out here. And the person really spearheading that event or that idea is a woman by the name of Bernice Gibbs Anderson. She actually helped out in creating that script. And uh, she wrote tirelessly <laughs> to uh, uh, the National Park Service, to senators, to congressmen, to whoever would listen to her, saying that this is a historic event 
and there's nothing out there but this obelisk that was put out there in 1916. We have a reenactment. People come to this reenactment. They connect with history. This should really be a National Park Service site. And in the early 60s, she actually came out here with a Park Service historian, Robert Utley. And uh, it was a dirt road out here. And they came out here in January. And they looked at the site. They looked around. The historian agreed that this could be a, a park site. And then they got stuck in the snow on their way leaving here. And uh, to get out of the snow, the historian stayed in the vehicle. Robert stayed in the vehicle and uh, <laughs> operated it. And uh, Bernice Gibbs Anderson had to get out and get in the back of the pickup truck to get a little extra traction to get out of here. So that gives you an idea just how forgotten and lonely this place was in the early 60s before the Park Service got a hold of the site. So you, you are describing and experience that. Any of us who live in Utah have certainly yes. been through a time or two. Uh, but yes, I, I think that definitely drives it home. Wow. Okay. So the, the site is established, and wh where do we go from there? We become a national monument first, and then in anticipation of the 100-year anniversary, so 1969, right. we get this uh, visitor center, and uh, we actually get two non-running locomotives. They're both... Older locomotives, and they're mocked up to look like the Jupiter and the number 119. Mm -hmm. And we have a 28,000-person event out here for May 10th, 1969. 28,000, 28, 000, two, eight 000, zero, zero. Yes. You're kidding me. And I know one of them was at least John Wayne. He came out for the event. Uh, <laughs> All right. I didn't believe it till I saw the photographs, but he did and visit He was this. there, huh? Okay. Uh, so you have, I, I mean... Geez, the, the actual ceremony itself, back in the 19th century, high estimates are a thousand people there. That's correct, like, actually. I mean, yeah, that's, that, that, that would be a, a very high estimate, in fact. 28,000. Okay, all right. Sorry, I, just, I need to kind of take that in. I'm thinking through, you know, as I envision what I imagine it to have looked like, that, that's mind-boggling. How did the site even accommodate that? I mean, you, you don't have seating for... No, <laughs> I know there there are seat, there's seating out there today. Was there at the time? Do you, do you know, or am I uh, getting too into the weeds here? The seating or would the have sagebrush been, to be no, more appropriate yeah. with where we're at. No, all the photos I've seen of the event are it's just a sea of people. You look in all directions. They had a stage and they did have some shaded seating, but it's just a sea of humanity out here, all gathered around to watch the reenactment that had been started almost 20 years before but they came out here to see that moment reenacted. Wow. Well, I'd say everybody standing around and not necessarily having the best seating, that's historically accurate. <laughs> yes. So that's... Yeah, didn't improve on those conditions at all. <laughs> it was uh, not out of a lack of concern, simply trying to be authentic. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you could give Good. that authenticity <laughs> to John Wayne and company. I think that's important. Yeah. Okay. So it's... Uh, and forgive me, I want to make sure I get my National Park Service terminology correct here as I'm bonding with with you and the entity itself. So it's a site at this point. Yes. Site. That's the simpler one. You've only got one, one resource. One resource. Okay. So how do we mature from the 100th year celebration up to the 150th? So we start with a historic site in our visitor center here. And then eventually we start uh, acquiring land from the railroad itself because they actually still owned the, uh, the the rail bed out here. And this is the Union Pacific? Uh, it would have been the Southern Pacific. Oh, what, okay, yeah. okay. Right, right, right. You, you'd gotten at that earlier. Yep. I apologize. And so we start looking at other things to expand into. And we have uh, two driving tours. We have the West Auto Tour and the East Auto Tour, and those are, the West Auto Tour is about seven miles long, and the East Tour is two, and they converted the old railroad grade into road, so you can drive on the old railroad grade and kind of get an idea of what the construction would have looked like, um, an idea of their construction techniques. So you're driving on cuts and fills, and you see culverts, and if you look closely in the sides of the rock, you'll see the drill marks that they actually placed in there to drill a hole in the rock, pack it full of black powder, and blow out the rock so they can move it. That's and, awesome. Uh, it's an, it's an all-hand-built railroad. So I always tell visitors to think about just the amount of the manual labor that went into building things like this because they didn't have heavy equipment, right? and they didn't have nearly as good a high explosives as we do today. Does that um, driving tour, I assume that includes the big fill? 
The Big Phil and the Big Trussell are on our hiking trail. So okay. that the, that's kind of the third thing we have out here. Well, I'm not looking to derail. <laughs> no, no pun intended. I'm, I'm serious there, okay, <laughs> um, where you're going. But I, just as you were talking about this hand-built railroad, I mean, for me, the Big Phil is one of the coolest things out here. When it, Well, I'm going to let you tell it because you know it a little better than I do. Can you describe what's the Big Phil and why should we be in awe at this thing so the Big Phil, which was built by the Central Pacific, and the Big Trestle, which were built by the Union Pacific, those are the largest engineering projects for the two companies between the two mountain ranges, between the Sierra Nevadas and between the Rockies. This is their biggest hurdle that they have to overcome. And the gulch that they have to get across, it's actually a ravine. It's called Spring Gulch Ravine. They have to get across it. And you have two methods of getting across that. Uh, you either fill it full of dirt or you build a trestle, which kind of looks like a big bridge. So the Central Pacific decided to invest the time and the money in building a fill. So they spent two months. They hired 500 men, which were mostly local workers, who brought with them 250 draft animals and carts. And they spent that two months essentially building this big fill one scoop at a time. And it's about 170 feet tall, which is also the highest point in Florida. So they built a mountain slightly taller than Florida, which is just impressive to do by hand. And that's a good way to put it. Because, of course, if you, you go and talk here in Utah about building a, a mountain, we're, we're going to expect 10,000 feet, you know, minimum. Wow, though. I mean, I just couldn't imagine moving <laughs> that much earth. That is, it's insane. No modern tools, no, no nothing. Nope, it's all done one scoop, uh, one horse cart at a time, all built by hand. The Union Pacific, they built the Big Trestle, which is just to the south of the Big Phil. Okay. It's long since gone. Uh, we just have the abutments left where uh, it would have attached. But they built that in a record 38 days. And uh, it was said that it swayed a little bit when the train went across it. So you had to be <laughs> That's pretty, not terrifying, right? You had Just... to be pretty stout to, uh, to actually <laughs> ride a train across that. And they had to slow down considerably. So it wasn't in use for very long. And then uh, that wood just wasn't going to last. Right. So it's gone, but you can still see the big fill. Now, uh, tell me if I'm off on this. I, I don't know all the details of the lay of the land out here. Would that be a part of the grading and the building efforts in which the CP and the UP are literally building right past each other in their uh, obscene efforts to <laughs> grab land from one another? That's actually uh, one of the biggest resources we have here in the park is uh, we have evidence of that parallel grading that the two companies did 250 miles past each other because Congress hadn't uh, figured out a stopping point yet. Isn't that just crazy? I mean, that is, and we established no modern technology. This is all by hand, just a, you know, extra 250 miles. Just a little bit of greed and a little bit of corruption <laughs> goes a long ways in this industry. Uh, well, and when you're talking about Dr. Thomas Durant, I, I don't know if little is perhaps quite the adjective <laughs> we want to go with. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Um, so um, if I could shift us once yeah. more here, the 19th century train. Now, my my listeners have heard not just about the Transcontinental Railroad by this point, but they've also heard about gunslingers and train robberies. So they've heard a lot about red lanterns, you know, mm -hmm. signaling and whether or not that's a real red lantern <laughs> or if it's a bandit. They've heard mention of a fireman, which I explained at least one time. It gets a little repetitive if every single time one of these stories comes up, I'm re-explaining what everyone does. It takes away from the narrative, you know? Uh, so could you walk us through that you got the engineer, there's the fireman, what all makes this train, you know, makes it go? How How's this thing work? So our locomotives are, uh, we have the Jupiter and the number 119. They're replicas of the two that were here on May 10th, 1869. They're American 440 style locomotives. So the first four is for the four guiding wheels. The second four is for the four driving wheels. And then both of these locomotives lack trailing wheels. So that's where you get 440. Okay. The both companies used lots and lots of 440 and 460 locomotives. If you look at their rosters for what they had in use at the time, those are the workhorses of their companies. Um, and that's because they're kind of a jack of all trades. They can pull a fair load. They can go a decent speed. They have a good range. They're able to use those locomotives fairly efficiently. 
So with our locomotives, they have three sections. Starting in the back, so uh, if you can imagine yourself in the cab of the locomotive, on the floor of the cab is a hatch that opens up into the firebox. And that is, if you think of a movie where a fireman is shoveling coal or throwing wood into the locomotive, that's what he's doing. He's opening up that hatch, that firebox, and throwing coal and wood to get the fire going. So you have the firebox that's creating lots of heat and lots of smoke. And then next up is going to be the boiler, which is 800 gallons of water. And to get the heat and the smoke from the firebox through the boiler into the third section, which is the smoke box, it's going to go through the boiler tubes. So there's 166 boiler tubes inside of our boiler. They're about two inches in diameter. And uh, that heat and smoke is just going to go through the tubes into the smoke box and then the smoke box on top of it has the smokestack, and it, the smoke is going to go out that smokestack. The pressure that builds up in the boiler is eventually going to accumulate in the steam dome, which is the big brass dome on the back of the locomotive. The steam dome, most people realize it has the whistle in it because that is where the sound's coming from. Right. But it also has a throttle we, we, in it. We've all seen that iconically oh, yeah. <laughs> on, on a Western, right? It also has a throttle in it that the engineer controls, and he controls how much steam goes through the system, kind of regulates the pressure. The pressure then goes along the top of the locomotive through an internal pipe you can't see called the dry pipe, and then it drops down to the two cylinders that are in the front of the locomotive. Now, before it hits the cylinders, there's a box on top of those uh, cylinders called the steam chest, and it looks like a big brass box. But uh, inside is a slide valve, and it slides back and forth, and it'll put pressure on either side of that cylinder. So I put pressure on one side of the cylinder. It moves a piston in that cylinder back or forward, and then it vents that pressure into the smoke box and out the smokestack. It'll then put pressure on the other side of the cylinder, push the cylinder the opposite direction. And as you're moving that piston back and forth, it's moving the drivers which are attached to the drive wheels. And that's how the locomotive is going to be moving forward. Okay. The other cool thing with it is uh, since smoke and heat don't want to go horizontal, they want to go vertical or the smoke wants to move vertically by venting the pressure from the cylinders to the smoke box, you're creating a positive pressure in there. And then it's going to go out the smokestack and create a negative pressure inside the smoke box, which is going to pull that smoke and the heat through the boiler into the smoke box. So essentially you're able to stoke the firebox as you're running the locomotive. So bare minimum, you probably do need two people to run this thing. You'll have the engineer who's essentially the driver and the fireman who is not in charge of putting fires out and he's more in, interested in starting fires. That's yeah, kind of a different, uh, a different concept of our idea of fireman today, huh? And then uh, he's the one operating the boiler. He's making sure the boiler has the pressure and the steam to meet the demands of the engineer and the locomotive. Okay. Well, uh, let me uh, lob one more, at least one more question at you here, Lucas. So my listeners are interested in history. That's, it's not a hard sell for them, but big question here. Why should people care about the transcontinental railroad and about, you know, the, the, the golden spike? If, I imagine you have to get someone who asks you this sort of thing, right? It's, I don't know, the the dower uh, family member that's been dragged <laughs> on that vacation to this location. And you can see the withdrawal on their face as their smartphone doesn't really work that well out here <laughs> nope. and they can't scroll through social media. So they're actually stuck listening. H how do you articulate that, that to somebody to kind of point out that this is actually pretty awesome stuff? My favorite way to explain this to the layperson, to the average visitor, is to talk in terms that they understand. And so everybody understands time and money. Before the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, it took about four, maybe as much as six months to get from one side of the country to the other. And you're looking at a cost of $1,000 to $1,200 to do that. After they completed the railroad... And, and to be clear, 19th century I, yes. currency. And, so. Yes. So... <laughs> Put that in uh, in 21st century dollars, and that's that's uh, there's a reason why you're selling the farm and moving out west. Yeah, it's because, a mortgage. Yeah, you got to sell the entire farm and everything you own except for a wagon. Right. But then after they completed the railroad, you're looking at a transit time of around 10 days to get from coast to coast, and the cost is initially going to be a little over 160 dollars. You know, when faced the option of six months and 1,200 dollars, or 10 days and 160 dollars ahead. 
most people agree, like, wow, that really opened things up very, very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's pretty succinct. That's a well put. All right. Well, Lucas, a- anything else you think that we haven't covered or discussed about, whether it's the locomotive, the site, the Union Pacific, the Central Pacific, I- anything else you think people just definitely need to know? It's uh, it's kind of interesting to note how, you know, we're, we're a happy national park site. Like I get to uh, come Are to there work. sad ones? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, Flight 93. Okay, and okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Point taken. Point lot, taken. Lots in there. But anyway, I get to uh, come to work and I get to have a, a party that's over 150 years old. And that's what I get to tell people about is I get to tell people about this event that we all came together. We did. We had this just a very, very American moment where we have a lot of teamwork. Uh, we have a huge engineering project that people thought was impossible, like, say, the moon landing, which right. happened 100 years later after this. We have this project that people came together, worked on, accomplished it. We have this great goal. But we also have this story and this narrative of things that uh, are also very American, we have this little story of kind of a little bit of greed and the two companies building past each other. We also have this random spot on the map that turned out just to be a, uh, a compromise, but they had to fix it eventually. <laughs> uh, and then the, the other story I always love to tell people is the date of the ceremony was actually not supposed to be May 10th. It was May 8th. And the reason for the delay is uh, the Union Pacific uh, they were delayed a few days. Dr. Duran, of course, got kidnapped in Wyoming uh, momentarily. As one does. For not paying his <laughs> workers. And then there was a bridge that... Like, again, just so out of character for Thomas no. Duran. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then there's a bridge in Weber Canyon by Devil Slide that had been damaged by a flood. And so he got delayed there again. And then you actually have the day of the ceremony. You have the uh, two locomotives that were not actually supposed to be here. The original locomotive the Central Pacific wanted was the Antelope. And it uh, got into a wreck over the Sierra Nevada mountains, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, and then you have the number 119, which is a locomotive that was actually based out of Ogden that just happened to pull the boss here to the ceremony. And uh, the last thing I always highlight to people is we actually are flying the wrong flag at the flagpole by the last spike site. We're flying a 20-star flag. And the reason for that is we had a uh, uh, on May 10th, 1869, about 1,000 people here. No one remembered to bring a flag to fly over the ceremony. And lucky, <laughs> it was just like, wow, that's okay. the one thing you're going to forget. So now I, I realize that many of the, the military men were just kind of passing through. It's not like they were really planned to be here for, in, in a very long duration sort of way. But you've got a military regiment passing through and no one, no one was thinking flag, huh? So you have the 21st Infantry. Yep. Uh, they're passing through. Their band is the one that actually plays here at the ceremony. Right. They and a ward from Ogden, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. But lucky for us, there's a soldier with the 21st Infantry who sees that we have a telegraph pole right next to the last spike site, and we've erected a flagpole on it. And he says, well, I, I got something for you. So he pulls out of his pack a 20-star flag and lends it to the ceremony that day. And... We haven't had 20 states since 1819. So he has a 50-year-old family heirloom that he lets us have for the day so we can have something red, white, and blue flying over the last spike site. Oh, that's awesome. And it's just, it all comes together as this just American moment of this is a random location, two random locomotives, wrong day, wrong flag, but we made it happen. And that's kind of, it's a great story for Golden Spike. I love that. I am so glad we got that in there. Oh my goodness. Lucas, thank you so much. Clearly, you know how to tell a good story. And this is a very cool site. If someone wants to come visit here, we've got people listening here locally and around the country, I'm sure are the types who'd like to visit a national park. We're open daily or? We're open year round. In the winter, we occasionally close on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, just because our winter visitation isn't that much. But the best time to visit the park is actually uh, May through September. That's when we have our locomotives out. So if you want to get an idea of what this place would have looked like 150 years ago, come out when we're running our locomotives. And one of the greatest things about our park is we haven't really had any development around us. So when you look at the landscape, the mountains, the sagebrush, uh, usually not rattlesnakes, but when you look at all of that, it looks the same as it did 150 years ago, which is really just a great view shed for us. And we're very fortunate to have that. No kidding. All right. Well, Lucas, I just want to say thank you. 
once more. And I would encourage everyone listening, if you're passing through Utah, you're if you're here and you haven't made it to uh, visit Promontory Summit, not to be confused with Promontory Point, which I find a lot of people often do. I mean, I suppose if you put that in your GPS, it's uh, kind of close. It's about 30 miles to the south Yeah, of us. it is. It's, it's yeah. the actual, I mean, you will see the Great Salt Lake, so you there's will. that. Um, but by all means, I, I would absolutely encourage people to visit. I, I'm sure I'll be back here soon enough with my kids. So, Lucas, thanks again. No problem. History That Doesn't Suck is created and hosted by me, Greg Jackson. Special guests, HTDS researcher Ryan Griffith and research assistant Zach Weaver. Production by Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Theme music composed by Greg Jackson. Arrangement and additional composition by Lindsey Graham of Airship. For a bibliography of all primary and secondary sources consulted in writing this episode, visit htdspodcast.com. HTDS is supported by fans at patreon.com forward slash history that doesn't suck. My gratitude to you kind souls providing funding to help us keep going. Thank you. And a special thanks to our patrons whose monthly gift puts them at producer status. Fox Car Barrett, Will Caldwell, Christopher Cottle, Jason Carstens, Bryce Chaplin, John Frugal Dougal, Bob Drazovich, Joe Dobis, Duke DeKellis, Michael and Rachel Ercolini, Peggy Estrada, Diego Fletis, Andrew Fortunati, Lee Goldman, Bryce Hancock, Sarah Hatton, Jennifer in Houston, Brad Herman, Jeremy James, Dex Jones, Todd Keim, Aaron Lapellis, Chris Mendoza, Jeffrey Moots, Fox Osborne, Amanda Parker, Christopher Pullman, Sean Reagan, John Schaefer, David and Alexander Sharp, John Savage, Scott Slaymaker, Bill Thompson, Brandon Undheim, TJ Walker, and Jeffrey Watts. Join me in two weeks, where I'd like to tell you a story.